الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد respected listeners today we completed surah an-naml in the beginning surah an-naml is makkan surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Allah mentions the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam followed by the story of Sayyidina Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam two stories about Sayyidina Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam the first one is that once he was marching with his whole army that consisted of animals birds men and jinn and as they were traveling further ahead on their path was a colony of ants the queen ant the queen ant announced to the rest of the colony that quickly enter your homes for suleiman alayhi salatu salam is arriving with his army and because of the might and the size and the strength of this army they may crush you without realizing what they are doing so sayyidina suleiman alayhi salatu salam heard the voice and the speech of this queen ant to the rest of the colony by virtue of the wind that carried the voice to him and sayyidina sulaiman alayhi salatu salam understood for allah had made the wind subservient to his command and allah azza wa jalla had also taught him and his father the speech of the beasts the birds and the insects so on that occasion sayyidina sulaiman alayhi salatu salam was made to realize how much allah had blessed him Behind him was an entire army consisting of beasts, birds, men and jinn. Ahead of him were the elements and the wind. And the wind would carry the speech of insects to him and he also understood that speech. So Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu salam rather than being arrogant he was humbled by this realization and he prayed to Allah that Allah grant me the ability to be grateful for those blessings that you have showered upon me and upon my father. and that give me the ability to do good that pleases you and through your mercy include me in your pious servants and your pious servants the second story is that of the hudhud bird see then sulaiman alayhi salatu salam had a special hudhud bird it would carry out reconnaissance work for him one occasion he was absent for some time see then sulaiman alayhi salatu salam searched for it and became angry at its absence when it returned it told sayyidina sulaiman alayhi salatu salam that i have come from a very far place and i have come from the land of the people of saba uh, this is that same story of the queen of sheba with a certain item of news i have discovered an entire kingdom and over them rules a woman and allah has given her much she has been given much and she even has a mighty throne which is unique but i found her and her entire people worshiping the sun besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shaitan has led them into committing shirk and not recognizing the right of Allah so then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to the bird that we shall soon see whether you are speaking the truth or lying he then sent a letter with the bird that go on drop this letter and deliver it to the court of this queen she received the letter the letter was very very brief she announced that and read out the letter to her court it said this letter is from Sulaiman and it is in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful do not rise above us and come to us subservient she said to her court that i ask for your opinion what should we do they said look we are mighty in strength and we have a huge army and force we should we don't there is no need for us to bow down before him in this way but the choice is yours tell us what to do she said no we shouldn't confront him in this way rather let us see whether we can converse with him in a different way she sent some presents the people came with the presents so then sulaiman alayhi salatu salam said are you trying to appease me with your presents and your wealth what allah has given me is far better nay go back and tell them that you either come to us subservient and humbling yourselves before us or we shall come with a mighty army that you will never be able to face and we shall remove you from your kingdom in disgrace see then sulaiman alayhi salatu salam then knew with certainty that she would come and then he announced to his court including to the jinns that who will bring her magnificent throne to me before she arrives so we can show her and test her a jinn 
mighty in strength. He said, O Prophet of Allah, I will bring her throne to you before you can stand up from your place. And I am trustworthy in this task and I am strong. Another jinn who was strong, equally strong, but Allah had also blessed him with knowledge, said, O Prophet of Allah, I can bring you her throne in the blink of an eye. And when Sayyidina Sulaiman saw her magnificent throne before him in less than a blink of her eye, he said, this is my Lord's favor and bounty upon me so that he may test me whether I am grateful or arrogant. Uh, sorry, whether I am grateful or ungrateful. And whoever is grateful, he is grateful for the benefits of his own soul. And whoever is ungrateful, then my Lord is most independent and most gracious. Sayyidina Sulaiman said, before her arrival, change and mend her throne in some way modify the throne so that she th- we'll see whether she recognizes it or not. She was a queen and she was very intelligent herself. When she arrived, Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam said, is this your throne? She said, it seems like it. So she neither said yes or no. And then Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam told her, obviously a lot more must have happened in terms of conversation, etc. But Allah has only mentioned this part of the story here. He had a special palace prepared of glass. And he said to her, that enter the palace. So she entered the palace, and she thought that there was water. So she raised her cloak, or her cloth slightly, in order to avoid it getting wet. So Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam said to her that this is not water. This is actually a palace made out of glass. So she in reply said, oh my lord, I have sinned against myself. And I have become a Muslim. For the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds, with Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. And what's the connection between the two? Very simply, it's this, that Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam wished to demonstrate to her that despite your kingdom and your intelligence and your being the leader of your entire nation, you can make a mistake in the simplest of things. And you can be deceived in the most obvious of things. So if that is the case, then how can you be so sure that you are not mistaken in your worship of the sun and in your religion and in your way of life and in your abandoning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why he told her to enter the two things he told her to recognize her throne but she was thrown in doubt she could neither with certainty say yes nor could she with certainty say no even though it's the same throne that she had sat upon and occupied for so long so she was thrown into doubt and confusion about her own throne and secondly, when he told her to enter the palace, she assumed it was water, yet it was glass. So she mistook glass for water. So Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam told her that if this is the case with your throne and with, your, with the glass and water, then how can you be so sure that you have adopted the right path in worshipping the sun and other things of Allah's creation and not the creator Allah himself? And she understood and she embraced Allah then mentions the story of Sayyidina Salih and Sayyidina Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. Then Allah mentions some of the signs of his creation and his power. Allah also mentions some of the events of the day of judgment. And then the surah ends with the instruction to the Prophet وسلم, to worship Allah, the Lord of Makkah al Mukarramah and the Lord of all things. And that he should be a Muslim and that Prophet وسلم, has been instructed to recite the Holy Quran. We then read Surah Al Qasas. Surah Al Qasas is a Makkan surah. From the very beginning till about 45 verses, Allah has in great detail mentions the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam in, in a very eloquent style. And then later, Allah mentions in general the destruction of the peoples and the nations of your who oppose their Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah also mentions some of the signs of his creation. And then Allah mentions the story of Qarun towards the end of the surah. The story of Qarun is that Qarun was a very rich and powerful man from the people of Banu Israel, from the people of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah Azza wa says that we had given him so much wealth and so many treasures. Forget the wealth and the treasures. The keys to those treasures were so numerous and so heavy in weight that it took a whole group of very strong men to carry the keys alone. He was a magnet, a tycoon, something similar to Mr. Walmart or Bill Gates of today. So the people said to him, the, the, the pious people from amongst his nation said to him, 
that do not be arrogant because of your wealth. Do not flaunt your wealth and your power. And do not be arrogant. And do not walk proudly upon the earth. Allah does not like proud, arrogant people. What Allah has given you, be grateful to Allah for it. And use it in good. And seek Allah's pleasure. And seek your own hereafter through that wealth. And do good just as Allah has done good to you. And do not seek to create mischief and discord upon the earth. Allah does not like those who spread mischief. He, as is often the case with people who are deluded by their wealth, by their power, their position, or by any other gift of Allah bestowed upon them, he said that this, all this wealth and these riches are of my own doing. They are of my own earning and they are of my own standing and my intelligence and knowledge. It hasn't come from Allah. Allah Azzawajal says that does he not realize that Allah has destroyed many people and many entire nations before him who are mightier than him in strength and richer and wealthier than him. One day the same Qarun came out in a parade before his people, before the rest of Banu Israel. He came out in a lot of pomp and glory in a great display of his wealth with his whole entourage and people were marveling at him and his wealth and Allah quotes their statement very beautifully here Allah says he emerged before his people in all his glitter, zina and his beauty those who seek the worldly life said would that we were given what Qarun has been given Verily, he is a man of immense share. He is a man of great fortune. But those who were given knowledge said to... They never bothered speaking to Qarun. They never bothered mentioning his name. Those who were given understanding and knowledge. They turned around to these people who wished to be in his place, saying to them, Woe be unto you. The reward of Allah is far better for those who believe and who do good deeds. But this can only be achieved by those who are patient. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to demonstrate what he does with the likes of such arrogant, proud, haughty, wealthy people. Allah Azzawajal caused the earth to open up beneath him. And then the earth swallowed him, his entourage, his wealth, his belongings, his property and everything. And then in, straight away in front of the people, the earth sealed up again. In an instant, he, his wealth, his power, his whole entourage, his name, his glory, everything disappeared. And the very same people who only a short while ago wished to be in his place, learnt their lesson and they began to say, woe be unto us. Verily Allah makes plentiful his sustenance for whom he wills and Allah restricts it for whom he wills. And if it was not for the mercy of Allah and his grace upon us, Allah would have, Allah would have thrust us into the ground just as he thrust him. And verily the disbelievers are not successful. Allah then ends this story by saying, this abode of the hereafter we have reserved it and we shall make it only for those who do not seek loftiness upon the earth or facade. And the end reward is for those who have taqwa. Many lessons to be drawn from this story in this final statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many verses of the Quran in which Allah speaks about the same topic. That Allah does not make both the world and the akhirah for one person. And Allah's law is that either a person has the dunya or they have the Akhirah. And there are many verses that testify to this. We don't have time, otherwise I would have read and translated them. Verse after verse testifies to this. Allah, in his wisdom at times, may bless a person with wealth and iman, and in future, reserve the Akhirah for him also. But the difference is, you see, this person's heart is focused on the hereafter. His heart is full of belief and faith in Allah. And therefore, when he has wealth, it doesn't affect him. It doesn't corrupt him. It doesn't cause him to sin and to transgress as another person would be caused to sin and transgress who does not believe in Allah or who, despite nominally believing, whose gaze is not focused on the hereafter. And those who have been blessed with wealth but faith within, they are the kind of people to whom wealth means nothing. So if a million comes or if a million goes, it doesn't have any effect on them. And when they do have that wealth, they do seek to do good. They are pious in that wealth. They seek to share it with others. And they use it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in good rather than in, rather than in sin. And 
the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here describes the difference between those who are meek and humble and those who are proud and arrogant. And as I related a few hadith in the Urdu speech, I'll relate the same hadith again. Once, of, during, from amongst the people who came before us, there was a woman who had a newborn child. She was carrying him in her arms, very young in age, still being breastfed. The child, the mother, was looking on upon her people, and a man emerged in all his power, wealth, and glory in his entourage, just like Qarun did, marching with people before him and behind him, with all his wealth and pomp and ceremony, all this pomp and ceremony. So the mother, wishing the same for her son, prayed that, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, make my child grow up to be just like this person. So the child miraculously spoke in her arms and said, Oh my Lord, do not make me like him. A short while later, the same mother saw a maid, a maid being pushed about, rebuked, insulted and beaten and driven from one place to the other. And the mother saw the apparent disgrace and humiliation which this woman was being subjected to. So she, feeling for her child and for this boy of hers, prayed to Allah, O Allah, do not make my son like her. The child again spoke up and said, O Allah, make me just like her. Why? Because those who, in our eyes, are worthless, meaningless, either because of their appearance, their wealth, their social status and position. See, we are blind. We do not see the way Allah wants us to see. And we do not see shaitan the way we should see him. And shaitan views us, he and his entire army, in a manner that we can never understand. Allah says, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Verily, shaitan sees you, he and his entire army, in a manner that you cannot see them and that you cannot see him. So our whole perception is wrong. So we see people who are poor, who are not so privileged in appearance, in wealth, in position, in worldly position, in social position, etc. Especially wealth. And we think less of them. Yet in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tables are turned. And people like Qarun are the ones who deserve to be thrust into the ground. And Allah loves those who are meek and humble. For they are the true servants of Allah. No matter what people may think of them. And in a beautiful hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, رُبَّ أَشْعَثَ أَغْبَرَ لَوْ أَقْسَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ لَأَبَرَّهِ There are so many servants of Allah who are covered in dust whose hair, who, who are disheveled in appearance, and whose hair, both of the beard and the hair, head, is unkempt. Yet, they are so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if they were to swear in the name of Allah, Allah would ensure that their promise is fulfilled. Allah would ensure that their promise is fulfilled. Once, an incident took place in which some retribution was going to be taken. A pious man, a pious old man said, by Allah, this will never happen. Even though the Prophet ﷺ was present there. And it so happened that verily the retribution didn't, was not taken. So the Prophet ﷺ himself in amazement and in order to teach the people said, there are those servants of Allah who do not appear to be anything before anybody else. Yet if they swear in the name of Allah, Allah would ensure that their promise is fulfilled. The second hadith which I related, just two more hadith and I end. Once Prophet was sitting with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and a man walked past. He did not join them but he walked past and went. Prophet asked the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who was seated with him, what do you have to say about such a man? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, Ya Rasulullah, a man of great respect, honor and standing in the people and in the community. In a social way, in a worldly sense. If he speaks, people remain silent and listen to him attentively. If he commands, his instruction is obeyed and followed. If he asks, he is given. His request is met. His demand is met. And if he seeks someone's hand in marriage, that request is also fulfilled. Prophet never said anything. 
A second man walked past. The Prophet sallallahu said to them, what do you say of this man? Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, a man who is not recognized amongst his people. He has no standing, i.e. worldly or social standing or position in the community. If he speaks, he is ignored. If he asks, his request is not fulfilled. If he instructs, his instruction is ignored and nobody obeys it. And if he asks for someone's hand in marriage, it is refused. So the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, one single person like the second one is better in sight of Allah than a world full of the first kind. Than a world full of the first kind. And the final hadith which I quoted is that in Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullah relates a hadith in his sunan. This is related to the story of Qarun. That um, there are four kinds of people in the dunya. One, the first one, one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed with wealth and understanding. Second, one whom Allah has blessed with understanding but deprived of wealth. Three, one whom Allah has blessed with wealth but has deprived of understanding. And fourth one, one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deprived of both wealth and sense. Uh, wealth and sense. The first one, he is rich and wealthy, but Allah has given him that wealth. He spends that wealth in the pleasure of Allah. He recognizes the right of Allah in that wealth, and he uses that wealth to secure and improve his blood relations. He recognizes halal as halal and haram as haram. He is the best out of all four, and his, his is the loftiest position. The second one, Allah has not blessed with wealth, but Allah has blessed certainly with understanding. So he looks at the first, and he says, if Allah had given me wealth similar to the first one, then I would have recognized halal for halal and haram for haram. This is the meaning of the hadith. I would have recognized the right of Allah in that wealth. I would have spent it in the pleasure of Allah, and I would have used it to cement and bond my blood relations. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says that the second one, enjoys the same position and reward as the first one by simple virtue of his intention. He and the first one are the same in reward and in position. Third one is someone whom Allah has given wealth but no sense. So this man has the wealth but he uses it in the displeasure and anger of Allah. He does not recognize halal for halal and haram for haram. He does not use the wealth to cement and bond his blood relations. If anything, he uses it to disrupt them. And nor does he recognize Allah's right of zakat or of charity in any way. Most important, he uses it in sin. Prophet ﷺ says, of the four, he is the worst in position and in rank and in sin. And the fourth one is someone whom Allah has deprived of both wealth and sense. So he hasn't got any wealth. But he looks at the third and says, just like the people of Qarun said, I wish that I had what Allah had given him. So if Allah had given me what Allah had given him, Allah has given him, I would do exactly what he does. I'd live the life. I'd live the life. I'd do this, I'd do that. And he doesn't do anything, he's just dreaming about it. Yet still, he would spend the wealth in Allah's anger and displeasure. He would not recognize halal as halal and haram as haram. Nor would he spend that wealth to cement the relations of blood that Allah has instructed him to. And nobody recognized Allah's right of zakah in that wealth or charity in any other way. Most importantly, he would spend it in sin, just as the third one. Prophet ﷺ says, he, the fourth one, in rank and in sin is exactly the same as the third one. Exactly the same, even though by virtue of his intention alone. So, this hadith is very similar to the story of Qarun in that those who have been given knowledge and understanding, they said, no way, this isn't what we want. And those who only wanted the worldly life, they prayed for that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to understand. We should all ask ourselves to which category do we belong. Wallahu alam, every one of us thinks that we're not rich enough as much as we would like to be. Therefore, uh, very few of us are of the first category. Again, very few of us are of the second category. Some of us may be blessed with wealth and be of the third category, but the thing is, we all think that no matter how much we've got, we're still not rich enough. We in this country are richer and wealthier in every way than 90% of the world's population. But we are still not satisfied or grateful. And for us, our standard of poverty 
and wealth is not the poor child in any country in Africa or Asia or in a third world country who still cannot find clean water to drink, who still cannot be fed properly, who still does not have a stable diet. He is not the measure of wealth or poverty. So we do not measure ourselves against him. If we did, we would be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said earlier, we tend to measure our poverty by looking at Bill Gates and Mr. Walmart. We think to myself, I only, I've only got a £250,000 house, only £30,000 car, I only earn 60000 a year. That's nothing. When am I going to get 40 billion? 50 billion? When am I going to have wealth in the Swiss vaults? When am I going to have a private jet? Even then, people consider themselves poor. There's a really funny story which I related once of a Muslim I met. Many years ago, 11 years ago, he was earning half a, he was earning something to the equivalent of um, <coughs> was earning something to the equivalent of Khairan, inshallah, some other time. In any case, like, the person was earning a lot. He was a millionaire and Muslim and he said something to me and I looked at him in surprise and he said to me, Habasab, kya kare kharcha pura nahi hota? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and sallam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallah, we have to wish you Allah, ilahi illa anta mustafirukun. This lecture was given by Shaykh Abu Yusuf Riyadhul Haq and has been presented to you by Al Kothar Productions. For further information, additional lectures and books, contact us on 0121-773-5191 or alternatively by post at Al Kothar Productions, P.O. Box 6008, Birmingham, B10-0UW. United Kingdom or visit our website at www.alkotharacademy.org Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh